Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 810. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's July 5th, 2023. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. Many of you celebrated the freedom of us leaving the tyranny of England uh, yesterday. It was called July 4th, Independence Day here in America. Many of you are still in England. Uh, My audience is probably 40% uh, European or 30% European. And you're like, ah, we won. (laughs) So (laughs) to to whatever you feel about the the July 4th, uh, uh, certainly glad you could celebrate it. Certainly glad you could laugh at it. George, how are you doing today? Wonderful. We were going to go to the beach uh, for the 4th of July, but it was too hot. It was 98 in Tampa, 95% humidity. So instead, I took apart the carburetor on my lawnmower, and I am proud to say, Kevin, I didn't have any extra springs or screws when I was done, and it works. (laughs) It works. So I am pleased that I can undo a simple one-barrel carburetor. I'm really going going places in my life <laughs> we are uh sasquatch and my wife and i are parked out here in spearfish uh south dakota where for some reason there's some plant out there that is pollinating and that pollination is attacking my nose so please excuse me if i need to uh to blow my nose i'll press the mute button but i want to let you know that up front that any post nasal drip is not my fault it's just that this lifestyle while fun and wonderful comes with the uh the added dilemma you're going places your nose is not used to and that's (laughs) that's where we are here uh george we got you said at the beginning in our pre-show which happened about 40 minutes ago kevin we have about 14 stories don't worry they're all small and we got that down to i think 10 uh stories so let's just start this off um a lot of people don't know this but uh you have to get your church history together africa has lots of anglican saints uh uganda uh certainly has the martyrs of uganda that that are very famous i got to visit their grave sites when i visited there some 15 years ago uh zimbabwe has a saint as well but this saint is now involved in politics george how's that happening well, every June, there's the Bernard Mazeki pilgrimage from all across Zimbabwe, Zambia, Central Africa. People come to this shrine of Bernard Mazeki, who was a Christian martyr of the late 19th, early 20th century. He brought the Christian faith to Mashonaland in mm-hmm. southern Zimbabwe. I think Maradona, Madonna, uh, one's a soccer player, the other's a t- town in uh, southern Zimbabwe. Well, this is always a big Christian festival. It's the big event for the year. It's akin to the Uganda Martyr Celebration. And at the Uganda Martyr Celebration, you always get the president come, but he makes a Christian speech in Uganda. He doesn't do politics. Everybody knows he's the president, and we're glad he's there, but he doesn't go into his political agenda. This week, uh, last week, when the uh, Maizeki Festival was held, the president of Zimbabwe came as they usually want to do, but he gave a political speech denouncing his opponents, calling all good Christians to support his ZANU PF government. And this has caused a bit of a backlash. Now, there are two types of Zimbabwean bishops, uh, crooked ones and honest ones. The honest ones have been silent and off the record are saying, this was horrible, we don't want politics in the church. The crooked ones, like Eric Ruona of Matabili Land, and I say crooked because he's uh, facing several counts of embezzlement and theft, and they're not proven yet. But okay, alleged crooked. How, we'll, we'll, alleged we'll, crooked. We'll, we'll, we'll go halfway. Okay, okay. He uh, he said, oh, it's wonderful. The president should come, and we have freedom of speech, and if he wants to talk about his political agenda, that's fine. And so I think it's, you know, why I, this is an encouraging story because there's pushback from the people against the traditional practice of deferring to the big man, to the chief, and basically saying we have to be God-fearing people first, not members of a political party or this or that when we go to church. So this is part of the growth and maturity of a church where it's able to move, separate itself from the political world. Sadly, the Episcopal Church in the United States is unable to do this. Uh, 
whatever Elizabeth Warren wants comes before general convention. That's what's true at the last convention. Uh, but, you know, when you see a church that stands for the people, all people, whether supporters or opponents of a political party, you see a church moving in the right direction. When you see a church that allows itself to be hijacked by politicians, you're in trouble, I believe. Well, we had that with Michael Curry this week, who uh, proclaimed that racism is the solution to racism in response to the latest Supreme Court, uh, saying that we don't have to uh, use race to determine who get, goes to college. Well, I don't really care. I hate to say this, Kevin, but, you know, <laughs> Michael Curry is an affirmative action presiding bishop. He's sure. somebody who got where he did, not because of his merits, but because he was the most articulate person of his uh, minority uh, group yeah very dynamic speaker. and and so f mm. and you know i've been reading you know things you know there are other african americans who are overjoyed by this ruling because they have labored under the misap under the stigma that they're only a doctor they're only a lawyer they're only this or that because of race-based preferences so someone like uh, clarence thomas or uh oh who was the duck the uh, oh well ben, the, my, ben my point is ben carson ben walt, walt ben walt, carson walt, ben, yeah absolutely i can i can name you know 90 ben, or, or winston 100. sears the yeah. lieutenant governor of virginia mm -hmm. in other words the united states should be about merit mm -hmm. and in you know so that when the presiding bishop says it's terrible we should continue to discriminate against asians americans so that upper middle class blacks children can go to Harvard. Uh, you're, you're talking about someone who doesn't really have any sense of touch of reality. Yeah. It's crazy. And that wasn't even one of our stories, George. That wasn't even one of the 14. Uh, okay, now, I never intended for Anglican Inc. or any of the work I do to uh, be dissuaded by strange words to be a place where you could go in there and type the word, search the word, and Anglica. you go to the search feature of Anglica.inc and type the word disco. Never thought that would happen. But George, I can now type the word disco on Anglica.inc and a story will pop up about a parish in the Church of England. Oh, dear Lord, now what? Not just a parish, but Ely Cathedral. Yeah. Uh, there was a story, it was in the British National Press, and we have a little write-up in Anglican Inc., uh, where the Dean of Ely opened up the cathedral to uh, 800 young people for a rave or a disco party, and it's been described differently, uh, in different ways, uh, but the Dean's intention was to familiarize young people who don't know church, who don't are sort of put off by the cathedral, to be comfortable with it. And he says he's not expecting all 800 to come to church the next Sunday, but perhaps over time this will start them on a process. I laud the dean's motives for bringing people into the church who are now alienated from it. I just think this is a totally useless uh, way forward that speaks to not understanding the post-Christian world in which we live. Um, this past uh, Fourth of July, the local Freemasons Lodge had a big bounce house out front and hamburgers and hot dogs and had a thing, you know, come in, see the Masonic Hall and find out about being a Mason or this or that. And, you know, it looked fun and, uh, you know, hamburgers are nice. But unless I was so inclined to become a Mason, I wouldn't bother. I'd take the hot dog. I'd, if I had a five year old, <laughs> he'd bounce in the house for 10 minutes. Sure. The point is, in a post-Christian world, um, we're not seeking, we're not, the church is not one of a number of entertaining options. In the post-Christian world, the church is alien. And if you're trying to basically make the church look like the world, you are not attracting people to the church. You're attracting people to the world. And that's not going to stick. Well, you're, I, you're a church historian. You have have a great understanding of, of church history, and no, I just got a lot of books, but uh, got a lot of books. some of them I've read. You know, two, three, four hundred years ago, the model of a church was to be the parish uh, for a community, 
where people would come to there, not just for church services, but for much more. But I don't think that was ever intended to be a rave. And I don't think, or disco, because I don't think the priest is aware of how bad today's music is and how anti-Christian it is. And to some of the absolute sick, depraved things, music, uh, I, I could put up a video right now that of what was the number one song three years ago, and you would be absolutely disgusted. And I don't think music, the culture's music, is what you want in our churches. Well, when Snoop Dogg becomes a commercial pitch man for all sorts of products, when he becomes middle, clay, middle class and respectable, mm -hmm. Snoop Dogg, whose music is about bitches and hoes and all the sort of ghetto, yeah. you know, shooting cops and uh, denigrating women, when that becomes old hat so that he can peddle various consumer goods, you know, our culture's, you know, pretty far down there. Um, 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 75 years ago, people would go to the church fair because there's the only thing happening that day. Uh -huh. And uh, there weren't a lot of options. Today, we have the option, you can go to church or you can stay home and watch it on, t on your internet or you can watch or do anything else. Um, COVID, one of the major changes in COVID that brought into my community was the youth sport leagues after COVID reopened, uh, after the COVID restrictions were lifted, claimed Sunday morning. So all of a sudden we lost half of the kids because they were playing soccer or volleyball or baseball because their schedules and practices now were on Sunday morning. And we lost them. Uh, they'll come to holidays, they'll come off season, but for the parents, uh, I hate to say this, uh, sports was more real to the child than the worship of our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, and, and when you're putting a rave in a cathedral, when you're putting, you know, we've talked about other cathedrals, Had one had, was it Rochester that had the slide, the giant uh, slide? Yeah, some, yeah um, somebody had a, uh, what's it called, Harry Carey? No, it's a... Uh, Helter Skelter. Helter Skelter, Harry Carey, Jesus. Helter Skelter. <laughs> Helter now, Skelter. That's an English word because in America, Helter Skelter means uh, Charles Manson. It does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, the worldview, uh, again, I applaud the intention. But the worldview of the leadership of the Church of England who seeks to revitalize is completely misguided because they're not looking. My experience post-COVID and over the last 25 years is that people come to church when there's some sort of change of life, life crisis. They have children, they've moved here, they've lost a spouse, they've had a lot. In other words, there's something that happens in their daily life and the routine that sort of is a hiccup or a stop and they start looking for something else and the church then sort of responds to that and is there for that and basically has its doors open to it and we grow uh what does not work because i've tried all this in the past is to compete with the world in entertaining and diverting people having uh, the best pet St. Francis Fair, having a bluegrass concert, having a barbecue. People will come, but they will not come to worship with you. Well, we, um, uh, funerals, for instance. Sure. Go ahead. Funerals, for instance, are one of the best evangelism times I have because you get people. I had a funeral on Saturday, had 100 people, 20 from the congregation, the rest friends in the community. Guy was big into his local. Uh, car club uh, so we had all these modified 50s and 60s stock cars out in the parking lot mm -hmm. that was my opportunity to reach people who otherwise on sunday morning are at mcdonald's with their cars in the parking lot yep. drinking their coffee talking about carburetors if i am able and that's you know what a death gives them sort of Oops, stop let me pause and think that's how you reach them through the word and the sacraments not through entertainment that's my opinion. No, but there's true. I mean, the church has not been able to deal with a message in a time of prosperity. Uh, mm -hmm. in the la in, in 200 years ago, there was not a lot of prosperity in the world. And people who went to church went to church because they knew 
that uh, their success was not based on themselves, but based on uh, what they would consider God's blessing upon them. And now in a culture that where um, you know you get a job all right at college, you, you're making a hundred thousand USA dollars. Um, you know you can get earth that to pound yourself. Uh, they don't have that need for something bigger than themselves because they are the biggest thing in their lives or their paycheck is the biggest thing in their lives or their friend group is the biggest thing in their life and they have not uh, uh, made god the biggest thing in their life and you as a church us as a church will be very difficult to replace those gods they put before them i remember the sunday after 9 11 was the best attendance i ever had beat christmas beat easter Mm -hmm. And for two or three weeks after 9-11, we had people coming in asking me about evil, wanting to talk, and then it all pittered out, and within six months, we were back to normal. Mm -hmm. um, some people did stick around, but, you know, as you talk about it, the leisure culture in which we live, Kevin, is more seductive than the hard work of being a Christian. Sure. It's one of those things. Now the church will survive this, but um, I, you know, we got a lot of things hitting against us, like woke capitalism. Now you and I have talked about China and their credit system, where if you're a good Chinese person, a good Chinese communist, a member of the party, and don't you know make the news, you have a good social credit rating. You can fly out of the country, you get good banking rates, uh, your family, uh, it, it, you know, gets the benefit of you being a good communist. Now in the church, not the Church of England, now in England, uh, they're kind of imposing that themselves, but they got caught, George. This is a story that's popping up on several fronts simultaneously. The religion angle is that a retired vicar in the north of England uh, banks with, I think it's the Yorkshire Building Society, mm -hmm. which for an American is akin to what were used to be savings and loans. Um, but these are fairly big enterprises. It's not just a local one, one, one location place. And this savings and loan had its pride month and sent all these emails and how woke we are and little flyers in the lobby and and then they wrote to people, tell us what you think about our Pride Month celebrations. And this retired vicar, an evangelical priest, wrote back saying, I didn't like it because, you know, you're producing, and he was very polite. He was, wasn't, you know, condemning or nasty, just saying, I disagree with uh, introducing politics and things that direct uh, contradict my religious faith into your marketing advertising. You know, you've been around for a long time and didn't need it. I don't think you need it now. Well, the, the, the Building Society wrote back saying, we're canceling your account because of hate speech. Now, the man wasn't rude. He wasn't vulgar. He wasn't crude. He just disagreed with their political views, and his accounts were suspended. Simultaneously, we've had Nigel Farage, who was the uh, leader of the Brexit charge to get England out of the European Union, uh, in March, uh, Coots and Company, which is a private city bank owned by National Westminster, NatWest, uh, said, we're closing your account. And it's a business decision. And they wouldn't tell him what the decision was, but eventually the, the company told some reporters, well, he maintained less than a million pounds in his capital account. Now, there's no requirement to do that. Uh, so, And other Coots customers have said, that we don't have a million pounds in our checking account. And Farage has tried eight different banks, all the high street banks, to open an account, and none of them will give an account. And because of his political notoriety, he is being sat on. Lawrence Fox, who ran for mayor of London, who's a friend of this show, uh, along with Calvin Robinson, that sort of group around the GB News. Lawrence is an actor mm -hmm. um, and a politician. He uh, has, was never able to get a bank account for his reclaim party. They wouldn't open an account for him. Um, and he, uh, and he, he's had to close his Barclays account because of his political views. 
Now, the government is stepping in because banks hold licenses to serve the common good, and when they begin to discriminate, that is a, an issue for the government to decide that whether can you can discriminate against people for viewpoint. Uh, but, you know, these Muslim charities that promote jihad and everything, they don't have a problem with the bank <laughs> accounts of these major accounts. No, none so it's ever. the prejudice is all going in one direction against mm -hmm. conservative Christians and con conservative politicians and political groups. Well, now and we do we've have, seen a little bit of this in America, haven't we, Kevin? Sure. I mean, uh, especially with, you know, the last person you want to be right now is uh, a member of the NRA. Uh, the NRA, the National Rifle Association here in America, has lost its bank's accounts and has also lost its insurance companies uh, because the the current political process of the Biden administration and the uh the Obama administration before the Trump administration was very anti-gun and forced New York uh, State and other places where the NRA had uh, their accounts to make it illegal to be gun supporting. And we see that here not so, we see that here for conservative stuff like uh, gun rights and that. Uh, we're also starting to see it for um, Christians, but we had a big Supreme Court win here for the Christians who don't want to uh, subject their artistry to things they don't believe in. So we have wins and losses, uh, and I think our next story is the web designer uh, who just won in the Supreme Court, George. Yes, and uh, Neil Gorsuch, the only Episcopalian left on the Supreme Court, they used to all be Episcopalians, but that was then, this is <laughs> <Yes>. now. <laughs> Neil Gorsuch wrote an opinion that struck down a Col Colorado has been particularly aggressive in cracking down on freedom of thought. They've had the gay cake baker came out of Colorado. They've had the, all sorts of stuff. And this particular case is a website designer who specializes in, you know, does marriage, wedding and things like that is declined to do gay weddings because of her deep Christian beliefs. It's not that she's providing hosting services or things like that. It's not It's not a public accommodation uh, issue, whereas if she were a restaurant or providing a, uh, a generic service, rather she provides her artistry to design and create things that reflect who she is as an artist. It's the same arguments with the cake designer mm -hmm. and with photographers and things like that. And Colorado says you mm -hmm. must do things for people who are using your artistry and skill for people whose views you oppose. And the U.S. Supreme Court has again slapped down Colorado saying, no, you cannot be compelled to mouth speech which with which you disagree and use your artistry and skills to further a pro an agenda that is abhorrent to you. We can no more ask a Jewish baker to make cakes celebrating the birthday of Adolf Hitler. Uh, that, you know, there are plenty of photographers, website designers, lots and lots and lots of people out there. You cannot compel everybody to think the same way. So that's a very powerful ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court, written by an Episcopalian. Well, it, it's a perhaps really, our church should listen to the listen to him. So no, well, it's a ruling that affects everybody here in America. It affected me. Um, I mm. was not always a Anglican commentary person. I was not always an IT person. I actually started my uh, self-employed career as a disc jockey, a mobile disc jockey. I would do weddings and weekends, class reunions. Um, and I, I presided in Huntsville, Alabama, and did this for four years. Towards the end of my time as uh, owning a disc jockey company, I got a call one day from the local swingers club. I did not know there was a local swingers club in uh, Huntsville, Alabama at the time, but they called and asked if I would perform a function for them um, where I would give my artistic sp skills as a disc jockey uh, and they would be entertained. I said, I can't do that because of my Christian beliefs. I will find somebody who will do it for you. Is that good enough? And we worked out an agreement where that, that, where that, was, that was done. Because Kevin was not going to perform to swingers. <laughs> Sorry. I, you know, am I prejudiced in that way? No, it just, it's beyond my belief set. 
and we made accommodations to that. Kevin is also an IT person. I own a uh, uh, a Florida-based IT company. It was Connecticut-based. I would not do the same as an IT company. Uh, we discriminate against nobody, race, creed, religion, sex, uh, gender. That, that's completely different because it's an IT-based structure, not an artistic-based structure. And yeah, if, if you were difference. selling records, if you were selling records in Huntsville, Alabama, you That'd couldn't say, I'm not going to sell to the swingers. Right. But if you are basically being an entertainer, which is essentially a disc jockey's job using yeah. the, the music. Yeah, I, and uh, I was really good, too, by the way. I, every weekend yeah. I was booked, you know, so... Were you the guy doing the monster truck uh, voiceovers? Uh, <laughs> I, be there Thursday. <laughs> well, back in Madison, I, I worked for a radio station. Yes. <laughs> Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> monster truck, truck, truck. Yeah, so that was you. Oh, wonderful. So good news on the U.S. legal front. Bad news uh, mm -hmm. in England with uh, prejudice against uh, legal viewpoints. We need to start saying no, because this is kind of a secret cancellation. We're canceling mm -hmm. you without being public about it. We're canceling your accounts. We're canceling your insurance. We're making it so you can no longer live and act in society. Now, if I remember my book of Revelation, that's in there. That's in there. That's kind of the mark of the beast, is you cannot uh, perform commerce or be part of commerce. Well, whatever. I'm just digressing here. On to more stories, George. Let's go down here to story number four. Canada, the Anglican Church in Canada, has a cinder, uh, cinder, has a synod, and they talked about gender transition liturgies. It was going to happen somewhere. Had to happen in Canada. Well, the Anglican Church of Canada is is doing is unhealthy, mm -hmm. and. It's decided it needs to keep on doing what it's doing, but do more of it to turn itself around. So being woke and crazy, we need to be woker, woker and crazier in order for people to come back and fill the pews. Uh, a few years ago, uh, began the discussion on liturgies for people in transition. You were baptized a boy, you've now grown up, you think you're a girl. Should the church have a liturgy to rename you and rebaptize you and this and that? Well, you've only can be baptized once. So we've they've come up with a baptism light for people who want to be re regendered. And this has no real theological grounding or foundation. It's just the Canadian desire to be nice to people. Uh, now, some Canadians, the Diocese of the Arctic was quite clear, saying, we will not agree, we will not do this. And so an amendment was offered saying this has to be approved by the bishop before used in your diocese. So the Arctic and some of the few conservative Canadian dioceses will say, no, we're not going to allow this, but we'll see it in Toronto and Montreal and Vancouver, uh, where you can go into church and be rebaptized for all intents and purposes. Looks like it, sounds like it, smells like it. It's just not called that because the Canadians believe, yeah, well, I guess we can't rebaptize because you're still the same soul. Uh, just. Well, will they make uh, appropriations or a, a liturgy for a person who's repentant after they discover, after the surgery, after transitioning, that um, no, they were always their original biological sex. They've repented, they're coming back to the church. Um, and they want their old body back. Is there a liturgy for them, or are we going to de deny they exist? Well, actually, there is a liturgy. It's called the uh, Confession of Sin. Absolutely. Reconciliation of a Penitent. In other words, if you have gone off into the craziness and come back, you can be received and forgiven, and your life and your soul can be restored to fullness of relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've mutilated yourself, I'm sorry, there's not much the Church can do about that. But your chromosomes won't have changed, just uh, your equipment may have been uh, removed. Modified, removed. Um, it's the social contagion of this age, for sure. Let's move on. Oh, but, okay, new topic you were, we were discussing in our pre-show. You said that they're ending the Good Friday prayer, asking for the conversion of the Jewish people. I, 
in the Anthrist of Canada, and I'm like, I did not know that prayer existed because it's certainly in the 1979 and beyond. Uh, where have I missed this prayer? Well, because I don't think it's in 1979. I can't recall it. I, uh, I do Good Friday prayers now 30 plus years. It's in the old Episcopal American prayer book, and it's in the old Canadian book, prayer book. And this is a big push to be nice to Jews. And so how the Anglican Church of Canada envisions being nice to Jews is, is removing from a liturgy that is not used by anybody because they have modern rites for Good Friday, which 99 and 9 tenths of the parishes use. They remove the references to pray for the conversion of the Jewish people. And at the same time, they had dropped a pro-Palestine, anti-Israel, rapidly Israel's a apartheid state. But see, we're nice to Jews because we're no longer going to pray for them. Uh, here's the funny thing. Most Jews, religious and observant Jews of my acquaintance, are happy that I pray for their souls and that they know the Lord Jesus Christ as well as supporting their right to exist in their own independent state. Mm -hmm. Because my prayers may or may not do anything but my saying the Palestinians every right to drive them into the sea, that doesn't, you know, it's hypocrisy on the Canadians' part. In my so is, view. Uh, so is there gender, gender transition uh, liturgy? It's, it's complete hypocrisy. And see, and see anti-Zionism has always been in church circles the the disguised uh, habitat of the uh, anti-Semites. Mm -hmm. The kooks come out, and we'll probably get a few kook comments here, uh, anti-Semitic comments. We always do when we mention Israel. But uh, That's right, kooks. Let's uh, do that transition news story to the Church of England, if we're going to talk about kooks. Uh, Church of England, we talked about a couple weeks ago, has decided to divest itself from fossil fuel and oil and sell its shell shell shares try and say that 10 times fast when you have pollen attacking your nose and um they have enjoyed this wokeness uh they started a long time ago with payday loans but in as such you told me a story that uganda and certainly the archbishop of uganda has decided to bless oil fields in northern uganda whereas the church of england is going this way on human sexuality <laughs> And that way, on divesting from oil industry, the Ugandans are going the opposite way for sure. each story. Last week, the uh, Archbishop Stephen Kazimba was in northern Uganda blessing oil wells and oil fields uh, and giving a speech saying that petroleum and coal and fossil fuel extraction is the ticket out of poverty for Africa and for Uganda. If we don't have to buy oil from the Saudis, if we can mine it locally, we can build a society that has roads and schools and the infrastructure that the West has. But for us to follow the West blindly and say we'll rely on windmills or we'll rely on the good graces of Americans to come in and give us you know, money to buy uh, electricity from an international power grid, it's foolishness. The green agenda Essentially, as we boil it down, Kazimba is saying the green agenda, as mouthed by the Al Gores and the platitudes of the West, uh, and the people of the West, is an anti human agenda. It keeps people in poverty who are already in poverty, while it allows the elites to basically virtue signal their uh, importance and their moral superiority because they already have achieved energy sufficiency and can lead a certain life, degree of life, whereas the vast majority of the developing world who hasn't achieved energy sufficiency is now condemned to continued poverty. So it maintains the power of the elites, it maintains uh, their moral self-satisfaction, self and therefore, the Archbishop Stephen says, drill, baby, drill. <laughs> well, you, you raise a good point here. I mean, uh, the United States does not use uh, wind and solar as its primary source of energy. And it never will. It's not sustainable at that level. However, they act like they do. England does not use solar and wind um, or any, any European country as a primary source of their energy. They still use nuclear. They still use fossil fuels. There's no way to completely transition to that form of uh, uh, neutral energy. 
doesn't exist. It, uh, it, it can't be done. In fact, to this point, since 2014, uh, the world has spent $4.1 trillion converting to wind and solar only to raise um, their that source to 3%. 3% of uh, European and American energy comes from uh, non-fossil uh, 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 sources. That includes dams, <laughs> that includes wind, that includes solar, and a few other sources. That's a lot of money spent on just 3%. And it, it's hard to see now where we're not just going to spend our way uh, for another $10 trillion to get to 5%. Um, it doesn't make all, any sense. Well, think of all this money spent on the green energy. What if it was put into rebuilding the re infrastructure of the United States? What if all these billions sent to Ukraine to fight a war, which they're going to lose, were spent on fixing the infrastructure of Africa, of putting in water pipelines, of building roads, of, you know, putting in wells and sanitation and sewers? What would, a lo what would the world look like uh, if our priorities were meant on improving the human condition rather than cementing the rule of the elites over us poor people. Yeah, I make a very good point, George. Um, and you know, as General, as President Dwight David Eisenhower said, you know, beware the military industrial complex. <laughs> before, he, before he left office, he said, you have to be wary of, of the country being captured by the people in government and in the military uh, industries who basically are going to suck us dry for all the money they can. And where are we now right now? We're we'll being sucked dry in never-ending wars and never-ending needs and never ever never-ending expansion of bureaucracy. Yeah. On to our next story. Now this, here in America, we had a pastor who threatened to burn a Quran from Florida, Florida pastor story, uh, must have been 10, maybe 12, 15 years ago. Uh, it was an important story in my mind, but we did report on it on Anglican Unscripted at the time because a famous Southern Baptist called this pastor and said, don't do it. It's just not worth it. And uh, so he didn't. The Quran was never burnt, but it made headlines everywhere for weeks. And he gave this pastor the intention he needed. Um, in Sweden, I learned that a uh, conservative uh, person has, or organization has burnt a Quran, and we are now uh, in Pakistan and other places blaming the Christians for the burning. Um, yep, yeah, a, uh, a I'm not quite certain if they were conservative Christians or conservative politically or mm -hmm. what sort of activists they were, but they basically were attention seekers. They burned a Quran on the steps of the, I think, the Iraqi embassy. Oh. And this has caused Christians in Pakistan to be murdered because of the offense of burning the Holy Quran. And so the Christian bishops, Anglican and Catholic, have been on the radio and the press in Pakistan saying, we condemn this terrible act. Pope Francis condemned this act. Um, Francis went a little further saying that uh, uh, free speech needs to be uh, uh, subordinated to not offending people. I don't agree with that, but the, the end result has been that the church in Pakistan, ordinary rank and file Pakistani Christians, this is the excuse, a Muslim militant who's got evil thoughts anyway, he can basically take it out on a Christian. We had had a story in Anglican Inc. of a, a Christian woman at a university. She was some sort of uh, administrator, was raped and murdered because she refused to convert to Christianity and the police aren't investigating um, because uh, she was a Christian. And they don't, they don't have the civil rights that a Muslim has in Pakistan. This is becoming a depressing so, so, episode. So what, <laughs> yes. Well, well ac actually, you know, when, uh, you know, this is what Justin Welby talked about. When the Church of England uh, was going to adopt, uh, the, when the House of Bishops recommended gay blessings, Welby said, yes, I realize this will lead to people being murdered in Nigeria and Pakistan. But we're still going to do it anyway. 
uh, was Welby's response, which basically tells you all you need to know about Justin Welby. Well, yeah, that he, satisfying he, the rabid left in England is worth more than the lives of poor brown people halfway around the world. Yeah, screw the consequences. I know. All right, on to some more news. Still Church of England type news. We reported uh, frequently over the last year about Martin Sargent, a person who was able to get his hands on millions of pounds uh, by just being the nice guy, being the jack of all trades, being the guy who said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. What's this? What's the final reports out on Mr. Don't Worry About It? What's going on, George? Uh, the Church of Diocese of London published, and we picked it up on Anglican Inc., the final report of the auditors, investigators into the Martin Sargent crime. Sargent was convicted and has been jailed for stealing millions of pounds from the Diocese of London funds. And Sargent, over 12 years or so, was able to be a very successful thief and con man because he had no Confederates, there's nobody to rat him out, and he just made himself indispensable so that he was completely trusted by Bishop Charters, the former Bishop of London. Um, he was completely trusted by all the committees he found himself appointed to. He was, he was always the guy who said, well, I'll take care of it, don't worry. He dissolved or relaxed accounting and standards. For instance, your parish was granted 10,000 pounds and you spent 8,000 of it. Well, the rules say you have to give the 2,000 back you didn't spend. And Martin would say, well, we'll just roll it over into next year. You know, you don't need to worry about it. I'll take care. I'll I'll take care of it, and so people just stopped looking because they knew there were little fiddles going around. But it was all fiddling in the right direction. Meanwhile, he was setting up bank accounts and uh, putting in monies to be paid out ostensibly for church repairs and this and that into these bank accounts he controlled, and then whoosh, the money be sucked out and he'd spend it on gambling. Uh, it does It's not like he has it all in a Swiss bank. He blew it all at casinos. And the, 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 the moral of the story is that there were no accounting controls. There were no double signatures on checks. There were no audits. Uh, everything that a competent business entity would have to prevent theft. And the Diocese of London had all these rules in place. But because, oh, Martin's in charge, we don't need to worry about it. They let it slide until finally it all blew up when he retired, and people started looking at how all this was done. Yeah. It, eventually, it all comes back. I mean, but this is 2023. We're 15 years out from Bernie Madoff. We're 20 years off from Enron. We should have a common sense about us that it always gets checked. It always gets reviewed. And every church I've been a part of, there has been a review process, including an outside auditor, which they would pay for at least once every three years to have a, uh, somebody come in and sign off on it. And uh, just because we love our accountant, uh, we still want somebody with other eyes to see if we're missing something. And I, I, I don't see how this can happen, certainly in, in any church I attended, but it happens, George. We, we start trusting and we start looking the other way. And even if we have a little concern, don't worry about it. Don't worry about well, it. there's a, a sports story out of England and Australia that has something to do with this. Uh, oh. Evidently, I don't follow cricket. I have no idea what's happening. And evidently, in the England and Australia match, uh, the English batter thought he was out, but he wasn't at the time. And so the Australians were able to basically win by due to this fellow's confusion. And a big controversy followed with the British refusing to uh, say, well, this was ungentlemanly, uh, he was confused, and you should follow the spirit of the game, not the rules of the game. The Australians are saying, what are you talking about? You did this at a game against other people, uh, therefore, you know, the rules are the rules. Well, friends, I sort of come down on the Australian side of this, um, you know, you follow the rules and honor the spirit, but you don't just bend the rules so you don't offend people's uh, feelings. Yeah. Well, so all the English cricketers will now hate us and uh, tell us how <laughs> I've mangled this story. Okay, well, my, my one complaint about baseball here in America is uh, it just takes too long to watch a game. You're, you're at three and a half hours, 
That's a long time. What's the average cricket time go for? It must be shorter than a that. A week, I think. I don't a know. Week. It's an all-day thing. <laughs> it's an all-day. All right. So, more news. Diocese of Spokane has reversed its no vote on Charlie Holt. We've been reporting on Charlie Holt since he's been elected the first time and the second time and the third, the fourth, the fifth time to be the uh, new bishop of Florida. Uh, he is the bishop-elect, but he has to get approval from uh, around the country, including dioceses. And we, we don't know who's voted for him, who's, who's voted against, but the Diocese of Spok- so Spokane has made public that they're reversing the vote. Is that good news for Charlie? Is this a, a trend that's changing? Or is this just kind of the evidence that a moderate diocese voted no and nobody else is going to vote for him, George? I think it's the latter. Yeah. Spokane is a normal diocese, mildly liberal, supports this or that and voted against Charlie Holt the first time around and then reconsidered its vote and then announced it was publicly reconsidering and was voting in support of Charlie Holt. So short term, good news for Charlie Holt. Um, They've probably got most of the people's responses and they're probably working on other people like Spokane to reverse themselves before the clock runs out. So I to me, this is more, if a, if a diocese like Spokane is going to vote no on Charlie Holt, um, I could see Newark or Massachusetts or Los Angeles or some of these way out dioceses, you know, going that way. Mm-hmm. But when you've got sort of a, a middle muddle diocese, uh, I don't think it bodes well for Charlie's chances. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. And I have no inside knowledge. But I, I'm reading the tea leaves, and the tea leaves are pointing me to be not optimistic. Hey, well, just the last uh, press release we got from the uh, the Diocese of Florida regarding Charlie Holt seemed a little bit a uh, preparation for we we have bad news coming. And so, you know, we'll have to see what the the long term. Uh, when would when would we hear an announcement if he doesn't get the consent? Before the end of the month. Before the end of the month. Hmm. all right hey good bishop news there's a central diocese of florida if you didn't know that george is a member of that his church is part of that diocese as well you have a brand new bishop who four days into his term five days in has put out a letter saying that um our facility called canterbury is going to be closed while we try and uh figure out what's going on because we do not accept $40,000 $40,000 in losses a month. I'm like, $40,000, George, you and I should have known that. We should have known how much money was being uh, wasted on something like that. And we don't hear it in the Episcopal Church as well. I, I remember uh, there was a Camp Webb in the Diocese of Fond du Lac that was losing money left and right. Uh, this is 20, 25 years ago, and they, they had to finally get rid of it. Uh at a certain point, you got to cut your losses. But this is a famous uh, place. But the bishop who's in charge says we can't afford it. To me, this story, there are two levels of this story. There's the straightforward story. The Canterbury Conference Center in Oviedo, Florida, which is a suburb of Orlando. Uh, the bishop held a special meeting with its board, and he basically requested got the board to agree to resign en masse and have the director resign and he shuttered operations because now that he's bishop he's in charge and he's looking at this and they're losing 30 to 40 thousand a month and this is a very nice and that's it's not like we're talking about scranton pennsylvania or someplace or northern wisconsin where it's only but how many summer is from July 5th to 25th? <laughs> By the way, yes. We're, to- we're talking Orlando, Florida on a lake. Mm-hmm. So that, you know, this is an income, this should be generating income. And so it speaks, so we have, we've got the bishop jumping in, landing on both feet and basically shaking things up. But it also speaks to me to the problem with the Episcopal Church and the Episcopacy in general is that when you've got dead air, and a bishop who's not interested, the, these losses would have continued until there was no money left in the accounts. Um, 
but if you have an energetic and active bishop that can turn things around um that's the success and the fit you know you know i'd get fundraising appeals for this camp along with from the local pregnancy center along with the summer youth camp all these places and if people i think were aware of the extent of the problem 30 to 40,000 a month i think we would have acted much sooner but there wasn't as much information out there and the old bishop just felt well i'll let the new guy handle it oh well, good that's it's but that's working hold on but that's working the new guy is doing it my problem is the new the guy bishop, is handling it but yeah. But a better run ship would not have allowed it to get to this point. Sure. Well, let's do a quick calculation here. 12, there's 12 months in a year, times 40,000. Lots of zeros there. Uh, that's half a million dollars a year you guys were losing on your, your camp. Ouch. That's, if, you know, it, in Central Florida, half a million dollars in ministry goes a long way, George. Yeah. yeah that's well that's that's five curates co with complete packages and the whole shebang um the uh and the other thing is you know the suburbs have grown and now surrounded this camp and it's a multi-million dollar property mm -hmm. if they want to have a retreat and conference center on a lake somewhere there's plenty of empty florida look around here for instance uh <laughs> yes so that you know what is the best use of this land and i think we've got a younger bishop a more agile bishop a more go-getting bishop who can say if i got 25 million bucks for this property and i put 5 million into it into a summer camp or a conference center out in the boonies what could i do with 20 million dollars to build new congregations build new my complaint of all has always been when i was on the board and i was on the board three times over the past 20 years like nine out of the last 20 years i was on the government's board uh money was always there to build a new parish next to the latest gated community in suburban orlando out here in hooterville it was always difficult to get them interested because it's far away mm -hmm. um maybe now we've got a new new eyes looking at the problem and we can have more even growth well, let's see. Um, final story. We reported three or four weeks ago that the Episcopal Church's Executive Council has met in Rhode Island, and despite the, the, the disastrous numbers coming out every year about church attendance uh, plummeting, uh, Jeff Walton puts out his yearly story uh, trying to go through the numbers. He does a great job. We now have the Archbishop of York looking at the crashing of the, the Church of England, and agreeing with the executive council that the problem is not that we're doing the wrong thing the problem is we're not doing enough of the wrong thing george the archbishop of york gave his president diocesan presidential address and the archbishop of york's style really makes me wonder if he's a human being or whether this is an ai chatbot chat that writes his speeches because <laughs> you know the, the blandness and the platitudes and the cliches are just overwhelming. But if you get out your winnowing knife and clean it up, what the Archbishop of York said was that we need to do more of what we've been, we've, we've been doing a lot of innovative things, being woke, being progressive, adding bureaucrats, mandating diversity, centralizing everything, getting rid of the parish system in place of sort of these mega communities. We need to do more of that, not less of it. In other words, the path that we have taken of wokeness and cultural accommodation, we've not done it hard enough. And we need to go further and deeper and deeper, more and more into the craziness, um, which I don't think is going to do anything other than accelerate the decline of the Diocese of York. In other words, the Diocese of York's made the decision. Leicester is the sort of the poster boy where Leicester is the furthest along where they're going to basically eliminate the parish system and have these minster communities where two or three priests have to take care of 20, 25 churches. And so they're basically running around in cars all the time because they don't have any money anymore. So more money for administrators in the 
diocesan office, more diversity officers, more women's officers, more ecumenical relations officers, more black and minority concern officers, more people like that, and more communications stress specialists, more public relations specialists, less parish priests. And that approach, which Lester is farthest down the road, York is fully in favor of. Now, York is getting pushback from the Save the Parish community, which are a mix of liberals and conservatives who want the Church of England to be a parish-based church with your local vicar and basically meeting people where they are rather than having a parish priest who's basically only see him as his car pulls out of the parking lot as he's off to the next place. Um, but uh, Cottrell's not paying any attention. No. Well... I mean, this has been a depressing episode because the news is kind of blah out there. There's a lot happening within the church at local levels where uh, people are coming to Christ. The church is growing. We put up a story last week where the ACNA, ACNA is growing. Um, there is a lot of good happening. But strangely, a lot of our viewers just like these type of stories. Um, it makes the news. Bad news is the news. Uh, and things are going crazy. George, I look here on daily mail and uh uh it's, it's sometimes my, my news source white house cocaine was found in dime size baggie isn't that crazy george we, in two weeks we have a, a boob story from the white house and then we have a uh a, a cocaine story from the white house it's just a little crazy isn't it well, I hope the Secret Service doesn't bury this. I hope they take and get look for fingerprints on the packet. No, I hope they identify. No, well, I hope they identify because this isn't a part of the White House where there were tourists tromping through. No, this is a right. work area. Yeah, work area. So somebody on the staff or the president's family, and we're all thinking the same thing. I know. Yes, he was there. Now they found it when he and Dad were out at Camp David or outside. But you know, they have twenty-four hour security cameras. They know who was in the library. They know. They'll and if we don't get an answer, it'll even tell us even more than we want to sure. know. Yeah, that somebody's being protected. But hey, it's just so crazy. One I rule mean, for the rich, one rule for the poor. <laughs> no, uh, a bigger story than disco on Anglican dot Inc is cocaine found at uh, the White House. Yeah, well, it's usually just disco times. balls and cocaine go together. <laughs> go together. Kevin, I mean. Yes, it's the same, but no, not 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 so much anymore. Well, no, so much, but not not in press. Well, George, that was another wonderful episode. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 810 of Anglican Unscripted.